coincidence, I have great pleasure of introducing our first speaker, and I got to chair the Gavin Brown Committee this year. And I, I wanted to break protocol and say something about Gavin Brown. I think it's important that when we have prizes named after our members, that that information and knowledge be passed down. And uh, Gavin was a remarkable mathematician. Um, I can blame my father who taught him when he was an undergraduate in St. Andrews. Uh, and went to the same school that I did in St. Andrews. But while here, he capped his career with many years as uh, Vice Chancellor of the University of Sydney. So when we give these medals, we not only recognize the wonderful research of the recipient, but we recognize the considerable contributions of the person after whom we've named the prize. Last night at the Council, a new special interest group in the mathematics of computation and optimization was formed. And it's hard to think of a more appropriate first plenary speaker whose work exemplifies all the things we hope our special interest group will do than Jim Demmel. He's a fellow of the ACM, Computing, IEEE, Engineering, Siam, Industrial and Applied Mathematics, and a fellow of, and a member of both National Academy of Science and National Academy of Engineering. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience, he's a wonderful and lucid lecturer, and I would invite him to come and talk to us about his mathematics. Pleasure. Can everybody hear me? It's a pleasure and an honor to be here to tell you about uh, a bunch of joint work that has been done by a very large team of people whose names I will save until the end. And what, by the end of the talk, I'd like to convince you that designing optimal algorithms today requires not just the tools you might expect from computer science and numerical analysis, but also functional analysis, group theory, and mathematical logic. So it will be a very broad talk. But before I can tell you about avoiding communication, I have to tell you what communication is in the first place, because that's going to be our metric of success in designing optimal algorithms. So to measure the cost of an algorithm, I'm going to count two things, how much arithmetic it does, how many floating point operations it performs, but also how much data it moves, because that is by far the most expensive thing any algorithm does. And so that means moving data either between levels of memory arc, between your main memory, see I have a laser pointer here perhaps, between your main memory and your cache is one example, or between different processors over a network. Those are both what I'm going to be calling communication. Now, and here's my model of, that I'm going to use to, to measure the cost of an algorithm. I'm going to count how many floating point operations it does. I'll count the number of words moved over any one of those wires on the previous slide, and I'll count the number of messages sent. So what's a message? It's a bunch of words packed together into one contiguous chunk, which are then sent. And those are your algorithmic parameters, and then there are three hardware parameters. The time per flop, the time per word move, which is called reciprocal bandwidth in computer science, and then the latency. And those last two terms are called message, are called communication. So here is the fact that we're going to be using, there we go, is that on today's hardware and future hardware, those three hardware parameters are orders of magnitude apart. It costs much, much less time to do an arithmetic operation than it does to, word a move, to move a word of memory. And that's orders of magnitude less than the time it takes to pack it together to get it ready to move. And not only is that true today, it's been true for a while, all of those 
terms are growing apart exponentially. They're all getting better thanks to Moore's Law. Now, Moore's Law has been declared dead several times, most recently in a New York Times article on Saturday, but they're still, it's still moving slowly. So the time per flop is getting better, maybe 60% a year. Everything else is getting better, but you see it's getting better much more slowly. So even if your algorithm is not a communication bottleneck today, it may be next year or the year after that. So we want to avoid communication to save time. But that's not the only metric of success. Here is how much energy it takes to execute an algorithm. And so the vertical axis is the amount of energy on the log scale it takes to do a double precision floating point operation, add or multiply, moving data on the chip in, in different ways, or what's really expensive is moving data off the chip. So what I'd like you to do is compare here this 100 picojoules to do a floating point operation to somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 picojoules to move the data. So that's one and a half orders of magnitude more energy to move the data. And that's the blue line, that's today's technology. And the red line is the best guess in technology in a few years, and it's two and a half orders of magnitude. So whether your big worry or your funding agency's big worry is how long your cell phone will stay alive before the battery dies, or the million dollars per megawatt per year it costs to run your data center, or how long you can keep your drone flying, then uh, you want to minimize communication to save energy. All of this is a big there. So um, let's suppose that as algorithm designers, we didn't really want to pay attention to all of this technology because it changes all the time. And let's suppose we just wanted to pick one metric that we would stick with so we could just you know, do our favorite kind of mathematics. Then what metric might we be using today? How about the total distance moved by beads on an abacus, right? We would have chosen this hundreds of years ago, or maybe a few thousand years ago. In fact, that ring there uh, dates from the Qing Dynasty. It's about 300 years old. It was used by traders to count you know, how much money they were collecting. And so you might think, well, we would have gotten it right. That's, that's communication, you know, data movement. But you know, not quite the right metric. So, but you can also see from this that wearable computing is not a modern technology. It's been around for 200 years. OK. So let me now summarize what are the goals we want to try to achieve. And what I want to do is to redesign algorithms to avoid communication, to change them, to minimize the communication between all levels of the memory, between, say, L1 cache and L2 cache, between L2 cache and DRAM, between different processes of the network. And what I want to do is prove lower bounds on how much data an algorithm currently has, has to move to do it. Now, given those lower bounds, what we did was, naturally, we compared our current algorithms and libraries like LAPAC, for which I'm co-responsible. And, and it turned out they were all doing asymptotically more communication than necessary. So we've had to systematically go and redesign all the basic algorithms of linear algebra and now lots of other things you'll see in order to minimize communication. So here's some sample speed ups just to give you some ideas about what we're talking about here. It's not just a few percent improvement. And I won't have time to talk about all these algorithms, but I'll talk about some of them. So the first one there is 12x faster for matrix multiply. This is classical in cube matrix multiply, and it turns out people were leaving a factor of 12 on the ground, on the floor, just by not paying attention to communication. Uh, tensor contractions, no surprise, it's very much like matrix multiply, there's a big spin up there. All pairs shortest path, that, that smells like matrix multiply if you use Floyd Borschel, so you can get big speed ups here using the same ideas. Gaussian elimination and body codes, QR decompositions of matrices that are tall and skinny, many more rows and columns, eigenvalue problems, Strassen, and then lots of iterative linear algebra. I won't, iterative linear algebra is a huge field on its own. I will only have time to kind of summarize that stuff. I'm going to stick with the direct methods for this talk. So you don't have to take my word for it that this is a good idea. You can take the word for it of somebody at a higher pay scale, say President Obama. And so, so here's a quote from President Obama's uh, budget request to the Department of Energy, which of course he didn't write, some staff person wrote. But it says that on modern computer architectures, communication takes longer than the performance of a floating point arithmetic. And so, to minimize communication between processors, you have to reformulate the communication patterns in the algorithm. And so this was referring to work done in the Trilinos library at Sandia National Labs by a colleague, Mike uh, Haru. So I called Mike and said, you know, what are they talking about? And it was indeed our algorithms. So one of my, because it's being incorporated into his library by the graduate student from our group who invented some of these. So communication avoiding GM res, which I won't have too much time to talk about, and then the tall skinny QR. So, so that's what I'm going to be talking about. And so here's the outline of the, of the technical part of the talk. I'll survey the state of the art of communication avoiding algorithms. And I'll, I'll, I'll do some very basic, just reminding you of how classical matrix multiply works and why it's so slow. Then I'll tell you about the new one that's up to 12 times faster. 
I'll generalize that to QR decomposition and then to Strassen for Strassen-like elements. But then maybe the most interesting part of the talk for the more pure mathematical audience is how do we generalize this beyond linear algebra? And that is where the functional analysis and the group theory and the, and the, the mathematical logic comes in. And what I'd like to do is explain to you how to take these ideas and so you can take any algorithm, basically, that accesses arrays and where the subscripts you know, can be kind of arbitrary things like i plus j minus 3k, whatever, an arbitrary code, and write down the lower bounds, and I'll show you our progress toward writing optimal algorithms. But there's a lot more work to do. Uh, then I'll, I'll uh, oops, summarize just a little bit about communication avoiding curl up subspace methods, but I won't have time to do that entirely. Okay, so here's the summary. So let me say that summarize it for direct linear algebra. I, I've sort of said this already. We're, I'm going to show you lower bounds for anything that smells like three nested loops. Now, right now, your intuition is perfectly good, you know, what that means, but I'll have a careful mathematical definition later of what smells like three nested loops means. But that covers linear you know, matrix multiply, of course, but also solving linear equations, least squares problems, eigenvalue problems, the singular value composition, and so forth. And as I said, those are mostly not attained by algorithms and current libraries. So what we've been doing is inventing new algorithms that attain these lower bounds. And we're busy trying to put them into the standard libraries that we're responsible for, but there's still a lot of work to do. So most of it is, is just sort of sample of the speed ups. And that there are indeed large speed ups possible. Now, this theory tells you, uh, gives you a design space for what the optimal algorithm should look like, but it doesn't tell you all the details of how to actually implement it. So what we're actually doing is using auto-tuning. That means we write a program to write the program. We write a program that searches the space of possible implementations to pick all the constants right to get these speed ups, because that's something computers are better at than people. And then finally, I'll just say it's ditto for all of the iterative worlds, so conjugate gradients, GM reds, all of those kinds of things. Okay, so here's the lower bound, uh, and I'll, I'll do the proof later. So for anything that smells like three nested loops, here's the question. You have a small memory, say the cache, of size capital M. It's too small for your data to fit. The data fits in DRAM. How much do you have to move data back and forth between the slow memory and the fast memory in order to execute your algorithm? Because that's the expensive part. And let's just think about the sequential case. So in that case, the number of words moved by that, by that one processor that owns the cache is lower bounded by however many floating point operations, multiplies, and adds that processor does, divided by the square root of the cache size. That's a lower bound no matter how you implement it. And now in the parallel case, how do you interpret it? In that case, think of one processor is assigned you know, one piece of the work, so matrix multiplies is assigned n cube over p, that's the numerator. And the denominator is whatever local memory it uses. I'll talk about that later. So you know, one piece of the total memory. So this theorem has actually been known since 1981 for sequential matrix multiply, but now we know it holds for just about everything. It holds for all of the basic linear algebra subroutines, you know, solving triangular systems, for Gaussian elimination, LU, QR, eigenvalue, SVD, tensor contractions. It isn't just those basic subroutines, it holds for some whole programs. So for whole sequences of these operations that you perform. So if you want to compute the power of a matrix by you know, repeated matrix multiply, it applies to the whole program, no matter how you reorganize everything in that program. It applies not just to dense linear algebra, where flops is n cubed, it applies to sparse linear algebra. So, and of course, in sparse linear algebra, you don't, might not even know till the end of the program how many flops you did, but the lower bound still holds, and we can still ask whether we can achieve it. It applies in the sequential and the parallel case, and as I said, you don't have to do multiplies and adds in either group. You can be doing, you know, maxes and, and pluses and things like that, and so it applies to algorithms like floyd Marshall for all pair shorts back. Now that's the lower bound on bandwidth, on the number of words moved. I also want a lower bound on the number of messages, which are contiguous groups of words that are packed together. So here's a very simple one. The number of messages you send is going to be lower bounded by however many words you have to move, assuming you can pack them each with the largest possible message, which is a, a hardware parameter. So I'll just take the largest message size and divide that. And what's the largest message you can possibly send? The whole memory. So that's in, you know, it depends on your hardware, but this is true for every hardware. You can't possibly do more than fill up the whole memory. So this bound is just a factor of m smaller than, than that bound. And those are going to be my two goals against which I measure all of my algorithms. And I'm pleased to say this one of the best paper prizes you can Okay, so given those lower bounds, as I said, we compared them to the existing 
algorithms and LA packet scale packet, they frequently basically did not attain the lower bounds. We've been doing it wrong since forever. And so what we've had to do is go back and systematically reinvent linear algebra and some graph theory to do this right. Now when I say reinvent, what do I mean by new algorithm? Um, it's not just reorganizing the order of execution, right? Doing the same old algorithm in a different order. We, we need new algorithms with new numerical properties. So for example, partial pivoting, which we've taught for centuries, you can't do it anymore. It, it, it provably cannot attain the lower bound. There's a new pivoting scheme that does. New ways to encode the answers. You can't uh, represent orthogonal matrices the way we have for a long time. You have to represent them differently too, but everything works. And so, so all of these sort of have, have had to go in the game. Now, sparse matrices are much more challenging. Imagine you want to multiply two diagonal matrices. There's no magic there. You just do it the obvious way. You can't go any faster than that. So you need to have some assumptions about the structure of your sparse matrix in order to make any progress. So one example as a, you know, as a mathematician you consider first is ernest Rennie matrices, so random matrices. And indeed, you can extend the lower bounds to multiplying there. But much more interesting in practice would be uh, matrices which come from, let's say, finite element problems. And in that case, uh, those are, let's say, 2D finite element problems. Those are going to have what are called large separators in their connectivity graphs. And you can, the theory extends to those as well, too. So you know, using those sorts of assumptions, you can make progress, but there's still lots of different sparse matrices out there. OK, so now let me go back to something very basic, matrix multiply, and say, how do we do better than we've done for a long time? And so here is, you know, this is a sophomore, maybe freshman mathematics. There are my three nested loops. I'm going to loop over i, j, and k. In the inner loop, I'm going to you know, multiply a, i, j times b, j, k, and add it. So what the inner loop is doing here is I'm doing a dot product of that row of a, the i row, and the j column of b. So that's the code. Now let me add some comments to say how much data am I moving to actually execute that obvious algorithm. And so here in red are what actually happens. Now I'm assuming my two matrices, are, they're too big to fit in cache, but I can fit a whole row or a whole column. That, that's possible. So what am I going to do? I'm going to read in that row of A. I'll read in that entry of C. Then I'm going to have to read in each column of B to do that row times matrix multiply. And when I'm done, I can write C back to slow memory. So that is the obvious way of doing it. And if I did the three loops in a different order, it would be a similar analysis. So now, let me do the counting. And I see that if I, if I keep that row of A in fast memory, I only have to read it once. I only, so the whole matrix only gets read once. That's a lower bound. Each entry of C only gets read and written once. That's perfect. But I have to read the matrix B n times. So I'm doing that n times perhaps more than I absolutely need to. And so if I do the counting, I've done n cubed reads and writes, and that totally dominates the n cubed arithmetic, because each one of those costs much, much more than one of those. So, I, so this is it the same. I need to do better. And so here is the classical way people have improved on this. I'm still going to have three nested loops, but now I'm going to loop over blocks. And so these little blue things are not scalars anymore. They're B by B blocks. So I'm going to loop over all the blocks. I'll read in that block, read in that block, multiply them. It'll all fit in cache, and write the answer out to that block. So this line of code is actually another three nested loops multiplying little B by B matrices. And I'm assuming that B is small enough so that I can fit all three of these blocks in fast memory at a time. And when I do the counting now, I discover that I'm, I'm still doing exactly the same arithmetic, 2n cubed, but now the number of reads and writes has gone down by a factor of B. And so that gives me an asymptotic improvement on what I had before, assuming that I can fit all these three B by B blocks in memory. OK, so let's ask, have I hit the lower bound? So I'm just repeating here, I, as long as I can fit these three B by B blocks in fast memory, then the number of reads and writes goes down by a factor of B. So the bigger B, the better. How big can I make it? Well, three B squared, three matrices have to fit in fast memory, so B is going to be the square root of the cache size, and that, up to this constant, hits the lower bound. So that tells me I can't possibly do any better than that. But practically, you might say, OK, but what if I don't know M, right? I'm, I want to write a piece of code for any computer, and I don't know what its cache size is. And of course, real memories have multiple levels of cache, L1 and L2. So we can deal with that. There's, there's well-known algorithms which are called cache oblivious. They basically do divide and conquer, and they'll work no matter what you have. So I, I don't want to go into those details, but we can deal with all of those problems. OK, so now, oops, it almost sticks in the slide. Let me just give you a one-slide summary of the parallel case, because this is where we were surprised to be able to get the 12x speed up. So this is parallel matrix multiply, and it's a very obvious code. It's been rediscovered many times, and it's called 
Summa, Scalable Universal Matrix Multiply Algorithm. I didn't admit that name, that's just the inventor did. And so it's just going to do a very natural outer product algorithm. So suppose I have 16 processors arranged in a 4x4 grid. So each processor owns a little n over 4 by n over 4 submatrix of A, of B, and of C. What am I going to do? I'm going to do outer product. So I'm going to take that block of A, I'm going to multiply it by that block of B, and update it. There's communication required for that. So what is each processor going to do? Each processor owns a little piece of A, and so it's going to take that little n over 4 by you know, B block and broadcast it sideways. So those black arrows mean clean broadcast it to everybody in my row. Similarly, I own a little piece of a blue block of B. I'll broadcast that down my column. And every processor is going to get a blue block from his vertical neighbor, a red block from his horizontal neighbor, and you'll do a local matrix multiply. And if you do all the counting, it'll hit the lower bound. So what is the lower bound? So, some, so this is a summary of the lower bound for anything, not just matrix multiply. So I, mean, I assume I have n by, n by n matrices, and I get to have them on P processors any way I like. So there's no restriction that I have to use the layout in the previous slide. My lower bound applies to anything. But remember, I need to have an M in the, in the denominator. So what is M? Let me just make a reasonable assumption. I use as little memory as possible. So everybody gets one peak of the data, N squared over P. So what do I do? I plug that into the denominator. I plug the total work in the numerator, N P over P, and that's what I get, N squared over root P. And the number of messages is root P, no matter how I organize the algorithm. And the algorithm I just showed you hits that. And so does scale pack contain those bounds? Well, that was, and the answer was, for words moved, it actually did, except for the non-symmetric eigenvalue problem. But for messages, it was always asymptotically worse. We always did much, much more messages than necessary. So our first task was to hit these lower bounds by, with new algorithms for all of these problems. And, if, and so up to polylog key factors, we can now hit the lower bound for all, everything um, for all of these. As I said, we had to abandon partial pivoting. There's a new pivoting algorithm I don't have time to talk about, but you can still prove it's numerically stable. And maybe what's most interesting is that the only algorithm we can figure out for the non-symmetric eigenvalue problem requires randomization in two different ways. We don't know of a deterministic algorithm to hit the lower bound. In fact, it, uses, it sort of does divide and conquer on the spectrum, and so we randomize both for rank determination and for you know, splitting the spectrum into different pieces. So that was our, what we did for a while. And then we asked, can we do better? Can we do better than these lower bounds? And that's because I had an assumption here, which seemed natural at the time, that it actually isn't necessary. So why do I assume that I only use as little data at memory as necessary, right? I have a lot more memory sitting there, possibly. So the lower bound is still true if I, if I allow myself to replicate the data. And so the answer to the natural question is, can we attain it? And it turned out there was a previous version in the literature called three-dimensional matrix multiply, which only worked in this very special case that you had a lot of extra memory. You needed P to the one-third, P being the number of processors, extra memory, and I'm just saying it was rediscovered many times. And so, but we don't always have that, many, that much memory available. If you have a thousand processors, that's not a very big machine, you need 10 times as much memory to run this. But the theory says you should be able to do it no matter how much extra memory you have. Okay. So let me tell you how that is done now. And this works for basically all of linear algebra, not just matrix multiply. So he, I'm going to call it two and a half dimensional matrix multiply. It sort of it interpolates between the 2D one I told you before and the 3D one that comes later. So I'm going to assume that I have enough memory for C copies of my data. So I can have two copies or three copies, whatever works. And I'm going to take my processors and lay them out in this two and a half dimensional grid. So each grid is a square, and I have C layers. Each layer is going to get a copy. And so what is the algorithm, and I'm going to, get, to write down the algorithm very briefly, I'll just index them by i, j, and k. And so what I'm going to do is initially, I'll suppose I have one copy of the data, and it's spread out over the top layer. So that processor owns, you know, one quarter, you know, n over four by n over four submatrix of a, b, and c. And then, what does the algorithm do? In three lines of code, it says, I'm going to start by broadcasting a and b in each layer, so I have c redundant copies of all my data. Then each layer is going to run one seat of that sum algorithm I told you about. It's going to compute one seat of the partial sums of all the matrix multiplies. When I'm done, all the partial sums are going to be sitting on top of one another, and so I do a reduction at the end. I sort of sum everything up vertically. And that hits the lower bound, and no matter how much extra memory I have. So the question is, is it worth it? So let me show you some speed up numbers. 
So how about a 12x improvement, uh, for example? So this is on a reasonably large parallel machine, not, not that big, 64,000 processes. And I'm going to be comparing, and the vertical axis is percent of machine peak, so 100% of peak, which means I'm only doing arithmetic. That's the fastest I can go. And if I'm going slower, that means I'm spending time doing communication. And I'm going, to, I'm going to show you the data for an 8K by 8K matrix, so very tiny to use in all those processors, and then a much bigger matrix. And the blue, it says what fraction of peak I get if I only allow myself one copy of the data, and it's like 5% of peak. It's not worth using all those processors for that tiny of a matrix. But if I let myself make 16 copies, for which there's plenty of room, I can go 12x faster. And on this larger problem, I also get a speed up. It's not quite as big because I'm spending more time doing everything. So you might wonder, where does all that time go? Let me just do a little breakdown. Uh, and so this is for the 8K by 8K problem again. And the vertical axis is the time normalized by the slow algorithm. And you can see the slow algorithm is spending a little bit of time doing computation. But most of its time is sitting around waiting for messages or actually you know, pushing stuff into the network so it's green. And the new one is 12 times faster. You can see I reduced the communication by 95%. But even the arithmetic goes faster. So how could the arithmetic go faster? And the answer is the local matrix multiplies are bigger. And so the local matrix multiplies are also running faster because they're also minimizing communication on each local processor. So that's why this green goes down to that. Green. In the bigger matrix case, I've also gotten rid of most of the communication, but it was one third arithmetic and that has gone away. And so if this is where all your energy went, I may have saved you a large fraction of your energy um, anyway by, by doing this, even if it's only three times faster. Okay, so this one another So now, let me tell you this opportunity to use extra memory attains a sort of perfect scale. So here's the idea. What I'd like to do is say, my problem fits on P processors. I now am gonna double the number of processors. I'd like to go faster. But I have two resources to use. I have twice as many processors, but each processor has memory. So I have twice as much memory. Let me use all my hardware resources and ask how much faster I can go. And the answer will be, I'm going to get perfect scaling. So every time I add a processor, I'm going to use its memory. So let me just do a, you know, do a little scaling study. I'll start with a minimal number of processors. So each processor has memory M, and that's just barely big enough to fit my three matrices. And now I'll ask, well, let's suppose I increase the number of processors by a factor of C, and I'm going to get C times as much memory, too. What happens to the time I spend, and what happens to the energy I burn? So, one line formula, but let me explain the notation. I'll count the time per, um, the seconds per flop, that's gamma sub t, the seconds per word move, beta t, and the seconds per message, that's alpha t. And then I can write, take all those formulas I had in the previous slides, I, won't, I don't want you to you know, worry about the algebra, and there is the time it takes to run the problem on c times p processes. And what's important is how it scales. It runs exactly c times faster. So the arithmetic time went down by a factor of c, the uh, and all the communication time went down by a factor of That's perfect strong scaling of time. And now, let me just say the same thing about energy. So now I will also write down a little model. I'll count the joules per op flop, the joules per word move, the joules per message, but that's not the only place computers burn energy. You know, they get very hot. The memory is also burning a lot of, uh, of joules. So I'll count the joules per word of memory per second, and then everything else, leakage, fans, whatever else is going. Again, I can write down a long, messy formula, and all I care about is how it scales. And the answer is it scales perfectly. It takes no more energy to sol solve the problem c times faster than it does to solve it in the first place. So how can that be? Each processor is burning the same power. They're c times as many, and they run one c as long, so the energy is constant. And that's what we call perfect strong scaling, and we can't do any better than that. And it applies to n-body and Strassen and all sorts of other things. Now, here's a connection to topology, which is maybe not what you expect to hear. So in order to attain these lower bounds, I'm assuming that all the processors can perhaps talk to one another at the same time. Nobody builds computers with that many wires in them. So the question is, what do I assume about the topology of the computer in order to hit these lower bounds? Well, we can prove lower bounds on what the topology is of these computers. And the good news is the topology isn't that bad. People build computers that way today. In order to have this perfect strong scaling, you basically need to have all of your processors connected to three-dimensional torus. So each, everybody's connected to their six nearest neighbors. And that's enough to hit these lower bounds. That's enough for classical matrix multiply. It turns out for Strauss, you need a four-dimensional torus in order to hit them. So anyway, so there's that connection too. 
So now, let me go on to a rather different <coughs> algorithm, which is uh, QR decomposition, and tell you how to hit the lower, a new lower bound for that. And so here is, uh, I'm going to just walk through the algorithm. Suppose I have a very tall skinny matrix spread out over four processors, and each processor gets one fourth of the rows. I would like to, you know, co compute its QR factorization. So the first step of the algorithm will do no communication at all. It'll do a local QR decomposition, and it'll, it'll factor each of its local sub-matrices into Q times R. Now what I've done is I've implicitly computed the product, my matrix is the product of that block diagonal orthogonal matrix times a stack of four columns, four triangles. That's not a QR decomposition, but it's progress. So the next thing I do is I take those four triangles and I break them and I pair them up and I do a QR decomposition of each pair. There's communication there. And I get that factorization. And what, what I've done implicitly is factored that stack of four triangles into that block diagonal orthogonal matrix times a stack of half as many triangles. Progress. Then I take those last two pair, well, <coughs> excuse me, and do a QR decomposition again. Now that is the R. Maybe. So that is R. So what I've implicitly done is factored my matrix into the product of that orthogonal matrix times that orthogonal matrix times that orthogonal matrix times R. So that is the QR decomposition, but it's not the way we traditionally represent it, and, and so that is going to be the output format that we need to use for all of the later work. So, so let me summarize this in one line. So what I've done is I've basically done a reduction operation. So map reduce if you're used to programming in that way, or MPI reduce. All I've done is I've taken on my parallel machine each processor, I do a QR decomposition, and I pair them up, and I have this binary reduction tree, and out pops R at the end. Now, what if I have a different computer, a sequential one? So in that case, suppose I can only fit one quarter of my data in, in memory at a time. What am I going to do? I'm going to bring in the first quarter of the rows, do QR. Then I'll bring in the next quarter of the rows, stack R on top of W, do QR. Bring in the next quarter of the rows, stack it up. And when I'm done, I've had to read the, the data from slow memory to cache once. One is a lower bound. And I've got the QR decomposition, again, with a slightly different representation. And what if I have you know, a different kind of machine, where I have a dual core machine, and I have uh, you know, on-chip and off-chip memory, I might get a different reduction tree. But you know, what if I have a real computer, which is some complicated thing, which has multi-core, and multi-socket, and multi-rack, and it just goes on and on, all the complexity. I'm just going to choose the reduction tree dynamically. You know, at runtime, I'll know what hardware I've been given, and I can choose this particular tree to match the shape of the hardware to minimize all the costs. And so I'll get a different answer maybe every time I run it, but it will be the QR So just to tell you, this does get speed ups. So there are some numbers that we've gotten in the past on parallel machines, on sequential machines, uh, on a GPU. This was fun. This was four cities spread, four French cities connected over the internet, where a quarter of the, you know, this is a big data problem, a quarter of the data was sitting in each city, and so sending data over the internet takes a long time. But it still only, it still was 4x faster on four cities versus one because we could reduce the amount of communication over the internet by a large enough factor that it didn't matter. Um, here's another sort of cloud computing example. So if you just access the data twice, which is all we know how to measure in MapReduce, then we're only 1.6x times slower than touching the data twice in order to do this. And uh, my student implemented it on his laptop and uh, this is a sequential code, and he got so tired, and, and the, the data was too big to fit in memory, he had to go to disk, so it was thrashing the disk. He finally got tired and just turned it off. And the new algorithm was you know, infinitely faster, right? Because he didn't even bother to let the old one finish. In fact, it was ran within a factor of two of having infinite DRAM. So it almost completely hit the, the, the cost of the disk. And if you want to do a singular value decomposition, then this is the first step, and so the co extra cost of the SUD is trivial on top of all of this. So it lets you do that. Okay, so finally, let me just say a few words about what people, what you can do beyond classical linear algebra, which is to say Strassen and Strassen-like algorithms. And so I'm just going to sort of state the lower bounds. So for con let me contrast it by just restate restating what the classical lower bound was. This is flops divided by the square of the memory. I've just reorganized it a little bit. If you cancel all the m's, there's an m to the one half in the denominator, and that's so I can just look at that three there. Classical matrix multiplied as n cubed flops, and there's a three there. So what about Strassen? All I have to do from a typesetting point of view is change 3 to log base 2 of 7. And the proof is much harder, but the typesetting is very easy. And so I'm going to do n to the log base 2 of 7 into the 2.81 floating point operations, and my lower bound 
goes down asymptotically in a similar way. And what if I have a similar sort of Strauss and light gal -like? So again, I'm just going to change three to omega, whatever omega is. So if somebody, so the last time somebody invented a matrix multiplied with a faster, smaller omega was I think last year, or 2014. And so this is going down all the time, and now we know that we can make the uh, communication go down faster as well. So I should say, Strauss and Light has sort of a technical definition in it, uh, regular and connected. But I have a PhD thesis draft in my, in my briefcase that I have to read this weekend, where, where one of Olga Holtz's PhD students got rid of that assumption, so hopefully that will go away the next time I give the talk. And it should be for any Strauss and Light algorithm, without any assumptions on the connectivity of the graph. Uh, and now, you might say, this is too good to be true. Um, if I keep making M <coughs> infinity, you know, I, you know that I can't do zero communication, right? There must be a limit. And it turns out, we can prove that there's a limit. That all of this communication keeps, keeps getting smaller up to M to this limit. And so, you can use this much memory, and the communication goes down, then it stops. You've hit a global lower bound, no matter how much memory you have. And I'm pleased to say this one another. So now the question is, can I attain it? So let me just show you some speed ups. We have implemented this as well. And so here is a performance plot for a fixed memory, for a fixed matrix size, a very large matrix, 94,000 by 94,000. On a big parallel machine, the horizontal axis is the number of processors from you know, seven squared, since it's Strassen, convenient, up to you know, a much larger power of seven. Um, and the vertical axis is sort of the uh, reciprocal time. So it's sort of affected beta flop. So it's, uh, it's n cubed divided by time. So up is good. So that's how I can have a fair comparison of an n cubed algorithm and a, a non-n cubed algorithm. And so this horizontal line is the, is the absolute maximum for the n cubed algorithms. This is the 2.5, this is the 2D algorithm, one copy of the data. That's the slowest. This green line here is our algorithm where we use more memory as we use more processors. It's getting closer to the peak. The blue lines are previous attempts that people have made to parallelize Strassen without success. And the red line is our new algorithm, which is running you know, above peak. And in fact, that line is almost horizontal. That means we're getting perfect scaling. Because as we increase the number of processors, the, the, the time is remaining, the time, per, the speed per processor is remaining flat. That's the perfect strong scaling I was telling you about, because we're using all the memory that's available. And so that is, you know, as I said, this all extends to all other algorithms too in linear algebra. But I'm just showing you matrix multiply. And I'm pleased to say this was another result that got reward. Okay, so now that's enough of linear algebra. I want to now talk about how this generalizes to everything. So, but I'll start with linear algebra to sort of, you know, so when I state the general theorem, we'll see the special cases and how it applies. So there's the naive code, three nested loops. There is the block code that I told you about, where I'm going to still have three nested loops, but now I'm going to do a B by B matrix multiplying the inner loop. And the theorem that I told you about said that if I picked B to be M to one half by M to one half, in other words, these block, these subblocks of matrices are M to one half by M to one half, then the number of words moved is N cubed over M to one half. So where do all these one halves come? That's the question I want to generalize to any code. So let me tell you what the classical, well, some, the 11-year-old proof is that just applies to linear algebra. And this was due to Aroni, Tuscan, and Toledo. So here's the proof idea to get that lower bound. So suppose that I know that I have m words in my memory. I need to bound how much useful work I can do if I only have m words, whatever they are. So let's suppose I can somehow upper bound the amount of work that I can do by this number g. So no matter what subset of the data I get, as long as it's M, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. So let me assume I can do that. So now, can I bound the communication? So if I need to do a total number of operations, say F equals N cubed, how often do I need to refill the fast memory to do all of those F operations? I need to refill it at least F over G times, because I can only do it, you know, G flops every time I fill it once. So the cost to fill it is F because the memory is the size M. So the total number of words moved is m times its flops divided by this upper bound. So the hard part is finding this upper bound. So, so this is a sketch of the proof. There's a much more careful counting argument, but this is the sketch. So that I, what I need to do is say, if I only have m words of data, m matrix entries, how many useful operations can I do? I'll call that g. That's going to be the interesting part. And then, of course, I need to attain it. And, and that comes later. But I'm just going to prove the lower bound. So, so here's my geometric model of communication. 
I'm going to think of all the operations performed by my algorithm as an n by n by n cube. And each, one, each phase is going to represent a matrix. So there's the A phase, the B phase, and the C phase for multiplying A times B to get C. And each square is going to represent one entry of the matrix. So three phases, three matrices. And then, those are the phases. And what are the cubes? The cubes represent the actual floating point operations. So that cube has phases A13, B31, and C11. So it's going to represent, you know, please do the multiply and accumulate for that particular operation. So that's going to be my geometric model. So what I need to do is say, suppose I have m entries of a, most m entries of a and of b and of c. So I have that many faces of the squares. How many cubes can I have? How many cubes can I cover? And so this is a classical problem, but let me just remind you of the answer. So, um, so here is the simplest picture you can imagine. Suppose I, I want to do these operations that are represented by those cubes. And let's suppose it's an x, y, by y, by z little brick of, of, of cubes. How much data do I need to execute it? Well, I need the projection on this face. Those are the entries of A and B's. I need those <coughs> entries of B. And I need those entries of C. So how many operations am I doing x times y times z since it's a brick? Here are the, three are the three faces. And you can see the formula is just the area of A times the area of B times the area of C to the 1 half. And, and that is going to be bounded by, since each of these is the most m, m to the 3 halves. So that's the simple case. And the generalization, which goes back to 1949, is the lewis whitney inequality, which says that no matter what subset of bricks that I choose, uh, of little squares that I choose, I'll do the three projections on the faces. And I want, what I need is an upper bound on how many, the volume of that arbitrary subset in terms of the, the areas of projections. And here is the theorem that says the number of cubes is bounded by the product of the areas to the one half. The area is the data, how much data I need. So it's still m to the three halves. So if I plug that m to the three halves back in my formula, I get my, you know, and m cancels, and I get m to the one half in the lower bound. OK. So now I want to say, how does this generalize to arbitrary code? And we need to have this generalization of Lewis with So, but let me just apply the theorem a few times to see what it says. So there is my, uh, again, uh, matrix multiply. And it turns out that all I need to know about this algorithm in order to apply the theorem is embedded in this tiny little 3 by 3 matrix. There's one row for every array in the inner loop, ABC, one column for every loop index, and entry is saying which array has which subscript. So A has subscript I and K, I and K, so I have 1, 0, 1. That's all I need to know about the algorithm. The theory goes on to say, Please solve a little 3 by 3 linear program with this matrix and to, for the solution vector x. What I want to do is maximize the sum of the, of the entries of that solution vector subject to delta times x is less than equal to 1. And out pops this vector of 1 half. And the, the value of the linear program is 3 halves, which I'll call S of HBL. HBL is the acronym for three well-known mathematicians. You can guess who they are, but I'll tell you in a slide or two. So that's going to come out of this very simple linear program. And then what the theorem says is that, that no matter how I reorganize this code up here, matrix multiply, I have to do at least the number of loop iterations, n cubed, divided by m to the s of HBL minus 1, the output of the linear program minus 1, which is m to the 1 half. And how is it attained? It's attained by sort of breaking these up into blocks. And what are the block sizes? m to the exponents that came out of the linear program, m to the 1 half, m to the 1 half, m to the 1 half. So that's the theory applied to linear, all of linear algebra. Let me now apply it to the direct n-body algorithm and see what it tells us there. It tells us something new there, too, surprisingly. So now I just have two loops. I'm going to loop over all pairs of particles, particle i and particle j. That could be a little data structure that says, where am I? What's my mass? And what's my uh, electrostatic charge? And I compute a formula, and I update the force. Again, all I need to know is embedded this little matrix with one column for each loop index, just two now, and one row for every array reference. And that's all I need to know to optimize it. And the, the theorem is the same. It says, please solve a little linear program, maximize the sum of the x's subject to delta x is less than equal to 1, and the result is 1, 1, and the sum is 2. And so the theorem says that no matter how I reorganize the n-body algorithm, I need to do at least n squared over m uh, words move between fast and slow memory, and the block size is m by m. So let's see if this buys us anything. And the answer is another factor of 12. 
So people hadn't been doing this before. And so this is, we have 32,000 particles on 8,000 cores, and this is work of, of these folks. And so if you just have one copy of the data, so that means four particles per core, which is not very much, you spend all, in the vertical axis is time, so down is good. Almost all the time is green, which means it's communication. And instead, you're only doing this tiny little bit of rhythm. But by the time I've gone up to 64 copies, the communication has completely disappeared, and all that's left is the arithmetic. And so this is a, uh, obviously, a good speed up. Now, you might ask, where do people bother with the direct in-body algorithm? I mean, don't, doesn't everybody use a fast multipolar or something like that? Well, let me just give you some applications where people still do it this way. So, it turns out that in gravity and turbulence and electrodynamics, at the bottom, even if you're doing the fast multiple method, you're doing an in-body code locally. And so the faster that code shows up directly in these speedups. It shows up in engineering as well. I have a colleague who designs electron beam lithography for use in Silicon Valley to build better chips, and that's all done by the in-body algorithm. But here's an example I didn't know about until we sent a student, a student off to a summer internship. It's used to simulate hair at Disney. So if, if you've ever seen Brave, uh, then uh, Princess Meredith's hair is simulated by having a point along, you know, every little ways along each of her hair. And whenever she moves her head around and the hair bobs around in a really realistic way, that's done by an in-body simulation by the little pieces of hair, uh, uh, you know, uh, pushing away from one another so it looks, looks good. Now, the student, um, uh, Michael Driscoll, only spent three months at, at Pixar to do this. And unfortunately, the rules are you don't get screen credit if you're only there for three months. But this has been used in every uh, um, movie since then. So, uh, so, uh, so th th this doesn't have everything I talked about. There were a lot of other improvements that, that were put in for the in-body code. OK, so now let me just have a piece of weird code. This is not meant to be a real algorithm. It's just meant to show you how general this theory is. So I'm going to have six nested loops, and I'm going to have a whole bunch of arrays. I just kind of wrote it down randomly. So I'll have arrays A1, A2, A3, and I'll, some of them will have three subscripts, some of them have two subscripts, whatever. It's a mess. I don't care. And, but it turns out that all I need to know in order to optimize this algorithm is this array where I have ones and zeros saying which array has which subscripts. And then the rest of the theory is the same. I'm going to solve a little six by six linear program with that, lin with that matrix and out pops the magic number S of HBL is 15 cents. So no matter how I reorganize this code, I can't do better than n to the sixth, the number of loop iterations, divided by m to the eighth seventh uh, uh, is the communication lower bound. And how do I attain it? I take all of these numbers that come out of a linear program and use those as exponents, and that gives me the block size. So this is you know, very general code. And I could have if statements and all that stuff in there, too. OK. So let me tell you, you know, now let's get into the pure mathematics of where all this comes from. So here is my linear algebra model. And all I need to know about that, I'm going to optimize it this way. I'm going <coughs> to, excuse me. So all I need to know is that each inner loop iteration can be indexed by a triple of integers. So I'm iterating over some subset capital S of Z3, triples of integers. And then all I need to know about the inside of it is that there are these three projection operators. You know, and so I have one array indexed by IJ, another by IK, another by KJ. So that's linear algebra. So here's the general case, or more general case. I can have as many loop iterations as I want. I can have as many arrays as I want. They can have kind of arbitrary, messy, linear expressions. I'm allowed to have pointers. I'm allowed to have indirection. That's OK. I, you know, I can have you know, arbitrary functions that I can keep. So all I need to know is that I'm iterating over some subset of zk, k tuples of integers. And the, array, and the locations are accessed by these group homomorphisms. So that's going to be the mathematical property I use of all these subscript expressions. So c subscript is just you know, that group homomorphism. And a subscript is this you know, multi you know, multiplicity of things. And I just keep track of all this. So that's what I need to know. And so my goal is to get a communication lower bound and optimal algorithms for any code that I can describe that looks like this. So I'm iterating over some tuples, and I have these group homomorphisms. So how much data do I need? So here's going to be the question. Given a subset of loop iterations, how much data do I need to access? And that's sort of the, the analog of capital G from before. And so here's the question. I'm given a subset of zk. That's a bunch of loop iterations that I want to do then what I need to do is bound how many loop iterations there are, the cardinality of s, 
In terms of P1 of S, that's the entries of array 1 that I need, it's cardinality, and the number of entries of array 2, and the number of entries of array n. And so now, finally, HPL stands for Holder, Brass, Camp, and Leaf. And it's, they wrote down what I'm going to a uh, linear program. I mean, I'm going to call it a linear program. It doesn't look like that yet. And so for all subgroups H of ZK, I'm going to have this linear constraint on these numbers. I'm going to ask that the rank of H in the integer is bounded above by this sum of SJ times the rank of the projections. So that's a bunch of linear constraints, an infinite number of constraints, obviously, an infinite number of subgroups on all of these numbers. So then, we, what we need is a theorem that was originally due to Michael Lewis, Terry Tao, Anthony Carberry, and Jonathan Bennett, who we had to extend it in a certain way, uh, which says that given these numbers, then I can bound the size of that set of loop iterations by the product of these projections to some magical exponents. So this includes, for example, um, the uh, Loomis Whitney inequality is a special case, in which case all the exponents were one half, one half, one half. And the extension I'll say is that in their original theorem, uh, they didn't know the optimal constant in front of this, it's a one, so, which is good. So the theorem now, just doing all that same analysis we did before, given the program with array references given by these group homomorphisms, I'm going to choose these S's to minimize the, their sum subject to this HDL in your program, the these inequality. That gives me, maximizes this lower bound. The number of words moved is the number of iterations divided by m to the SHBL minus 1. So the linear program I need to solve is maximize the sum of these s's subject to this infinite number of inequalities that I'd like to, I'll still call it a linear program. Okay? So, so that's going to be our goal then is to sort of make this effective. Right? This, is, this, this is not effective yet. So if there exists a lower bound. So is this bound to you? So the first question you might ask is, can I even write it down? Now, let me go back to this. Um, is it really a linear program? Don't I have an infinite number of inequalities? Well, in fact, all of these ranks are integers in some bounded range, so I can only have a finite number of inequalities. So it actually is a linear program. So there is a chance of writing it down. OK, so here's the first thing we proved, which was kind of a that. And if you actually try to write down every inequality of that finite set, it's equivalent to Hilbert's tenth problem of the rations. Now, you may be familiar with Hilbert's tenth problem of the integers. You're having a set of integer polynomials. You need to decide if it has an integer solution. That was proven undecidable by Matusiewicz in 1970. So that's bad news. At the other extreme, there's uh, what if it were all real numbers, and it would be Tarski decidable. So what about the rationals, which are somewhere in between reals and, and integers? It's been open for 40 years. Nobody knows if this problem is decidable or not. So that sort of set us back for a little bit. Then we proved another theorem, which says that there is another linear program, which is a subset of those constraints, that is decided, right? You don't have to look through every, get every possible inequality that works. And here is a sketch of what the algorithm is. You'll see it's decidable, but it's not what a computer scientist would call useful. Uh, so let's suppose I have a list of all the countable subspaces of QN, right? That's a countable set. I can write down a list in principle. And I simply loop through that list, look at the first I entries in the list, and say, am I done yet? And there, you can decide that, you know. And, but you don't know how long you might go in that list. Okay, so that's, but at least it's decided, so we have some progress. So here's better news. I don't have to take an arbitrary list of all of the subspaces of QN. It's enough to take a very small set, relatively small set. I take all of the uh, group homomorphisms, I take their kernels, and I take the lattice that they produce under intersection and in And so uh, this, that's enough. And that's a much, much smaller you know, set that you can actually uh, you know, get your hands on. And in fact, if you go back and read Burkhoff's book on lattice theory, there's a corollary to the Dedekind that if you only have three arrays in your program, there's only 28 subspaces that you need to consider. And so that's a very finite number that we can, we can handle. Um, and so this is you know, a little bit more practical with that. Okay. So finally, uh, is, it bound, is this bound attainable? So what I need to do, suppose I can compute the bound, which I can in many cases, I need to somehow reorder the code to attain it, right? That's, that's the hard part. And so, or, or assign them different processors. So what I need to do is I need to maximize, reorganize them so I can maximize the number of loop iterations given data that fits in memory. So the number of entries of the A matrix, of the first array and the second array, and all of them add, fit in fast memory to size M. 
And so let me take the easy case first, which says I can order it any way I like. Like I'm doing matrix multiply, and, there's, and I can, because you know, I'm just doing addition, I can order it any way I like. And here's the theorem that works uh, partially then. So let's suppose that all of my group homomorphisms just pick subsets of indices. You know, like I pick i and k out of i, j, and k. So it looks like matrix multiply. But it turns out that linear program that I wrote down, its dual tells you the optimal answer. And, and if you solve the dual linear program, the, uh, the solution tells you all the tile sizes. And that, in fact, was the example that I gave you before. So in that special case, we know how to write it all down. And for matrix multiply, it's one half, one half, one half, and so forth. And it actually extends to where the uh, holger brasskamp weak linear program is determined by independent groups. So they don't have to be just subsets of indices. And in that case, what we're looking for is polytopes that tessellate the ZK lattice. That, have, that satisfy certain inequality. Okay. So there's lots of ongoing work here. I'm almost done. Um, what, we, what we're in the process of doing is implementing and improving algorithms to generate the lower bounds. Right now we have theory, but there's still a lot of implementation work to do. We actually have yet to find a case where we cannot attain the lower bound. So I'm going to state a conjecture is that you can always attain the lower bound, uh, you know, assuming you can reorganize everything. And so that would make all programs work. Um, the hardest case in practice, though, is when you can't have an arbitrary reorganization of your loops. So, so here, imagine I change the inner loop of matrix multiply to some messy thing like this where that's some weird nonlinear function. I can't do these in any order and get the right answer, right? There's some dependencies from one to the next. So I'm limited on which polyhedra I'm allowed to choose, which way I can tessellate the ZK lattice. And so the question is, how close can I get to optimal in one of these cases? So that, that requires a lot more theory. <coughs> Um, and it turns out that when we can do it, all that perfect scaling where we you know, can have c times as many processors and go c times faster, it all works. And so at least in some of these cases, we can have these provably optimal algorithms no matter how many processors we have. And you know, I, so the question is, does every programmer have to learn all this mathematics? That, that's not to be expected. But maybe every compiler writer. And so we've been uh, uh, collaborating with the compiler community to try to get them to implement some of these ideas. But that's going to take a while, but because we still have a lot of work to do. Okay. Um, so let me just have one slide summary of, of the story for iterative methods. Now, what's an iterative method? That's a method like conjugate gradient or GM res or land shows. There's a huge alphabet soup of them. What do they do? In each inner loop, they do a matrix vector multiply, and they build this subspace you know, that gets larger and larger, and they look for the optimal solution inside that subspace of vectors that they compute. And depending on the definition of optimal, you get a different algorithm. And so there, what's the inner loop? It's a matrix vector multiply. There's no data reuse possible. And so all the stuff I've told you before can't be applied directly. So here's our goal. We still want to minimize communication. I don't want to just pay the price of doing matrix vector multiply over and over again. So here, let me tell you the results on one slide. And let me assume finite element problems, you know, connected to your nearest neighbor. 